checking out a Caliber 40 LRC and I'm super excited about this boat in particular because the current owners already took it around the world once. So it's decked out for cruising. They seem to have taken meticulously good care of it. And from everything that we've read about the interior layout, it seems like it could be ideal for a family of four. So really excited about this one. Before jumping in, let's hear some advice from professional sailor and author, John Kretschmer. Good morning, Desiree and Jordan. So the road trip continues. You're off to see the Caliber LRC40. It's a really good boat. People tend to compare it to the Island Packet, and in some ways that's a good comparison, in some ways it's not. It's built differently. It's not a boat built with interior moldings. It's built mostly by hand, but really well done. It's a solidly built boat, and there are very few construction issues. The hull shape, especially when viewed in profile, looks really good. It's a long, fin keel. Not totally unlike the Tayana 42, um, slightly more modern in its proportions. And it's a really rugged skeg hung rudder. One of the things about the caliber though, is that the, it holds its beam further forward and its sections are full. It's a huge 40 foot boat. You're gonna be astounded how much space there is inside. The area in front of the keel is really wide and flat. And on occasion you will pound when you're punching up wind. There's just no denying it but that's kind of the trade-off of a slightly more modern four section. It's certainly not a great light air boat. It's a good moderate air boat and it's a pretty darn good heavy air boat. One of the big features and what makes it an LRC is the tankage. They have huge tanks. I think the water tank is close to 200 or 180 and the fuel tanks just over 200. Seems like a small thing, but traveling, finding fuel is always a program. Finding water, not so much these days, but it's really nice to run your water maker and top off a 180 gallon tank and know you're good to go for a long stretch. Overall, the Caliber 40 is a good boat. Would I call it a great boat? Mm, no, but great boats are few and far between. Is a boat you'd be really happy with? Yes. Does the aesthetic turn me on? No, but this is all one man's opinion. It's a cool boat and people are out there sailing the world in it, no question about it. So good luck, I'll be really curious to hear what you think about this one. I could tell immediately that the owners of this boat have taken ridiculously good care of it. Also, the boat didn't feel overly big to me. Unlike some bigger boats that can feel a little intimidating, I really felt like I could handle this boat. When we went down below, my first thought was, I want this boat, I want this boat. Everything was beautifully maintained, the layout felt modern and easy to keep clean, and everything was spotless, even down to the bilges. Hard for me to put a finger on it, but something about the interior really felt welcoming to me. So this galley is pretty awesome. It's got a lot of space. It seems like it's really functional. I've got my food prep area right here. Um, sink space is great. The refrigerator is ginormous, so I really like that. I love the storage in the galley. There's lots of areas for uh, plates, pots and pans, lots of extra storage down there. Another thing I really like about this galley is the ventilation. So right above the stove where I'd be doing all my cooking, there's a porthole right here and there's a hatch. And then moving forward, we've got another extra set here and right there. So. The idea of having a lot of ventilation in the tropics is really exciting for me. And the only downside um, is I was asking the previous owner if she was ever worried about, you know, because I use the pressure cooker a lot to cook, and I was asking the previous owner if she ever got worried about the steam that's released in the pressure cooker kind of getting in the navigation area. And I'm also wondering if this nav station area gets like a little bit oily or greasy. Um, and she said some caliber boats actually design like a little plexiglass wall or partition right here. She said she was kind of always a little bit worried about it but never had any problems with it. So not ideal, but still lots of space. And overall, I really like this galley. And as for the Godzilla headroom test, the boat passes. I have pretty much full headroom all the way throughout the boat. 
And the most important things to me are when I'm cooking in the galley, because that's the only time that I'm standing for prolonged periods of time. One bummer though, is that the nav station is pretty darn small for me. The space is not bad. I don't have sitting headroom here in the nav station, but the real bummer is gonna be where my feet are. The curvature of the hull is pretty extreme right in front of the seat. And so yeah, my left leg is almost cross-legged right now. I would have to not use this as an office desk, like I couldn't do computer work here. I would have to use this solely for navigating while we're underway. I do like it for that. I mean, being in a nice small enclosed space where you're not gonna be bouncing around a lot, it, it does feel safe in that sense. Yeah, so this is the quarter berth and you could definitely fit two adults in here. Be a little bit tight, but it would definitely work. Um, and then storage and you know its own door. So uh, yeah, this would be a nice, second cabin. I still don't know where I stand with like how much room kids need, you know what I mean? So much aerobics in here, so many activities. It would be perfect for one kid for sure. As for two, you know, little on the fence. And one real luxurious thing about this quarter berth is it has access to the second head. So I can actually get into the head without going outside of the berth. I will say that having this second head on a 40 foot boat, I think is kind of a big compromise because you end up having a much shorter set T. You end up having the nav station in this kind of awkward place. So you do definitely pay a price for this second head. how open and spacious this main room feels, especially with a table stowed up like this, how it is right now. The current owners were saying that a lot of the time they would actually keep the table in the down position because it does take a little bit of time and effort to set it up and that would be a little annoying every time we wanted to sit down and eat dinner to have to do that. Once it's set up like this, it is pretty cozy here and it also still feels big and I really like all the storage space that opens up. So yeah, I really like this spot. I can imagine doing some homeschooling or some computer work here. So this is the um, starboard set T and this was what the owners use as their sea berth. So when they're underway, they just put a lee cloth up here. And this is actually gonna be one of those big compromises for me especially for having this second aft head. That's gonna be the fact that I don't actually fit here. <laughs> oh. And as far as ventilation, I would say that this boat is probably the best that we've seen so far. Seems like they've put a hatch just about everywhere that they could. Also, all of the portholes open and they're regularly spaced throughout the boat. Oh, and it has two cowl vents on dorades so that water won't get in. You can get plenty of ventilation while you're underway with no water getting into the boat. Uh, it's just about as much ventilation as you could get on a 40 foot boat. I mean, this is pretty spacious. Um, not, not huge, but definitely sufficient. I love it. Yeah. It's me sized. And I like how the master bedroom is like totally separated from the rest of the boat. You know, mm -hmm. got my own door, got my own shower. Mm -hmm. I could just hermit up here for a couple of days. This is definitely your style. So another thing I love about this kind of master stateroom, and it really does feel like a separate part of the boat, is that the storage space is incredible. There's tons of places to put all of our stuff. Also, I like how they left this place bare so that we could potentially do like a little changing station up here. It's a little high, but I feel like we can make it work. And then this area, we could even make it into like a little crib. So the baby could be close by, but has their own spot. So I really, really like this master cabin. It's definitely my favorite master cabin that we've been in so far. Finally, we've got the master head, which is awesome because there's a ton of space. And then you've got the shower separate from the main head, so again, when you shower, you're not gonna get your toilet area all wet and nasty. And the ventilation in this forward head is amazing. I feel like it would be nice and uh, not too humid up here, nice and dry and easy to maintain and keep clean. Yeah, this little swim platform is so awesome. I could really imagine just hanging out here. Also coming up from a swim, you can rinse off right away. With some fresh water. Hot water, oh my God, what a luxury. Boarding the dinghy would be a lot easier. Coming on board the boat from the dinghy would be a lot easier. I also really like their Davit slash solar 
panel set up back here. I think they have a little over 400 watts of solar and it's nice and out of the way. It's not gonna get shaded by the boom or the sail. Also the Davit system is nice. It's not robust enough where you'd wanna go offshore with the dinghy uh, stowed in this area. But for just doing short hops, like you do 80% of the time, 90% of the time, this would be great. And it's also really nice to be able to lift the dinghy up out of the water every night for both theft as well as to make sure that the bottom isn't getting any growth on it. They also have this really nice little uh, outboard lifting davit and so they can lift the outboard separate of the dinghy and it can be stowed in a really nice secured position. All right, so I'm down in the cockpit locker and because the engine is relatively far forward, all of this aft area below the cockpit is actually just kind of like a machinery space and storage. Now I'd be tempted to fill this up with sails or you know, who knows what, but man, it's so nice to have this like dedicated space to just see all of the machinery. I mean, I see fuel filters, water maker, the shore power battery charger, the hydraulic autopilot, and the rudder post. Basically, everything that you'd need to work on, for the most part, is in this area. And I really like that a lot. I really like the livability of this boat. I think it would be perfect for an average height couple who might not need as much workspace as we do. But for us, the nav station was less than ideal and Jordan couldn't fit into the sea berth. So for that reason, I'm gonna give this boat a four out of five stars for livability. All right, so up here on the foredeck, there's a couple of different things that I really like. Um, first of all, we've got a bow sprit that's relatively short and is made out of like a stainless steel tubing and then a wood and metal anchor platform on top of that. So a handful of things I like about that. First of all, the fact that the bowsprit itself is all metal and the wood is just there to be an anchor platform. So that way it's gonna be strong and rot resistant or rot impervious, but also it gives you a lot of space to like work the anchors, to have two separate anchors. I mean, it gets the anchors out away from the hull when they're coming up. And then it is a cutter rig, which is what we want. They've got a 130 Genoa on the forestay, which is probably exactly what I'd want. And then this nice stay sail here. There is also enough room from the mast to the stay sail for us to fit you know, a, a good sized dinghy, which is great. And then here's the chain locker or well that you can access from the deck. Um, it's nice to have lots of storage for maybe a spare anchor to be able to look at all of the chain. Um, the one bummer about this is it's not a very deep well with the windlass all the way forward like this. The chain doesn't really self tend or self stow. And so as the windlass is pulling it in, you kind of have to flake out the chain manually. A little bit of a bummer, but overall, this whole system uh, like looks like it would work really well. And they've got this deck wash right here, ready to rock, so you can easily you know, clean the chain as you're bringing it, bringing it in, which, I mean, if you've seen our videos, can be a real pain in the butt if you're doing <laughs> it with a bucket. <laughs> And then the stay sail is on this self tacking track, which is really nice. I do like that a lot. There's no granny bars, so you don't have anything to, you know, kind of support yourself while you're up here at the mast, but you really probably wouldn't have to come up to the mast very often because the main is a in mast furled main. And so you can completely reef it or douse it from the cockpit. As for the cockpit, I really do like the cockpit. I am able to tack the boat, so I'm able to you know, deal with the Genoa sheets and winches while at the helm, so I could effectively single hand the boat. I really, really love the fact that when you're out offshore, you need to reef, you need to furl in a sail, you need to do anything, you really don't need to leave the cockpit, and that's amazing. 
again, you do risk a little bit of like mechanical failure, right? Because if some system were to stop functioning correctly, you're in a little more pain than if these systems were simpler. I do want to express though that we don't have firsthand experience with in-mast furling. I don't know exactly where I stand with that system. Other things to take note is that the Dodger and Bimini, they don't have it set up right now, but we have some pictures and that would be really nice to be able to stay out of the elements, um, out of the rain, out of the sun. We really like that a lot. This boat doesn't have a full bridge deck and a bridge deck is typically here. It'll be the same height as the rest of the seating in the cockpit. And the purpose is that if you get pooped, yeah, very funny. You know, if a wave like kind of breaks on the back of the boat and into the cockpit, if you have enough water filling into the cockpit, it'll flood down into the boat. And so a bridge deck is basically just a barrier so that water won't be able to get inside. Now they didn't do a full bridge deck here because it's a whole lot easier to get in and out of the boat if you don't have a full bridge deck. So they've got kind of a, a short one, kind of a stubby one. So if the cockpit were to fill up to here with water, you'd be fine. Any higher, you could have problems. Now I'm sure what they'd recommend is putting in like one washboard while you're out at sea. And I'm sure that would keep a lot of water from coming in. Um, but it's just one of those things that I've kind of been taught to think that it's a really good idea to have that. This boat would be so easy to sail offshore. For someone who would really appreciate the convenience factor of the in-mast furling and the short bridge deck, this boat would be perfect. But personally, I'm on the fence about these aspects of the boat. Also, the anchor chain stowage seems less than ideal to me. But all in all, I really do like the sailability of this boat, so I'm going to give it four out of five stars. So first off, what I really do like about the hull design of the Caliber 40 is that you kind of get close to the interior volume of an island packet, but with slightly better performance characteristics with a fin keel and a skeg hung rudder. I also really like the fact that it's not a canoe stern. So that aft area is gonna be beamier, allow for more volume inside of the boat, and it's gonna make for a little bit more initial stability, meaning that the boat won't heel over as much in moderate winds. And it's got a relatively high ballast to displacement ratio. So again, this boat won't heel over all that much. But a boat that is beamier fore and aft is going to be, at least in theory, less comfortable while offshore. The boat also has a relatively shallow draft which is gonna be great for sneaking into relatively shallow anchorages, but is going to really affect the boat's ability to sail to windward. So when I look at this information, I see a boat that was designed to be really comfortable at anchor, to cruise really well in moderately shallow waters and somewhat protected waters, and that compromises a little bit of sailing performance and comfort offshore in order to achieve that. And so for that reason, I'm going to give this boat three out of five stars for design. Now let's hear from our broker, Bernie Jackets. Uh, the Caliber 40 is a very robust boat, built extremely well. It is a liner boat, meaning that if you look at the ceiling, there's a lot of things you just can't get to. Uh, but overall, it's a good boat. It's an average sailing boat. It doesn't go to Windward well if you read the reviews. I think they're a little bit overpriced. I think if you can find a Caliber 40 for $135,000 to $165,000, you'll find a really good boat out there. But there are better boats. That's my opinion. I loved this boat. As Mona, the current owner, was showing us around, I kept on like whispering to Jordan, like, this is the boat, this is the boat. But after spending some time on the boat, we realized that the boat almost checked our three priorities, but not quite. So with priority number one, we wanted a boat that would be a good home for a family of four for the next 10 years. And it almost checked that box, the, with the exception of the nav station, which for somebody might not be a big deal. But for us, we make videos for a living. That office space is something that we're highly prioritizing. Also the fact that I didn't fit on the starboard set T as a sea berth would definitely be a bummer. Uh, but as for priority two, which is a boat that will let us do more sailing and less working on the boat, I think this boat did really well. It's in really great condition. The owners have really kept it up nicely. Um, but for priority three, again, it almost checks that box. And that's gonna be a boat that prioritizes 
sailing performance and comfort offshore over comfort at anchor. This boat definitely splits the difference between those two things. I think the boat was designed to be pretty darn comfortable at anchor and pretty darn comfortable offshore. And so the performance and comfort offshore isn't quite where we'd like Atticus 2 to be. I think that somebody with slightly different priorities than ours, this boat could be a really, really good choice. I feel like for the asking price of 150, it'd be hard to find a boat that's in such good condition that could safely take you around the world with a relatively luxurious interior. But for us, the road trip continues. So join us next week as we check out a Shannon 43 in Oriental, North Carolina. Also, our Kickstarter campaign for Atticus 2 ends today, and we have been absolutely blown away by the love and support and encouragement that we've received from you guys. So thank you so much for making Atticus 2 possible and for making this whole boat series a reality. We never in a million years thought that we'd be so lucky as to have such a great community as we have in you guys. So thank you and we'll see you next Thursday.